Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ping Yao Guo, and this is Elizabeth Namor. So today we are going to talk about the work that we have been doing uh, lately. Uh, so the topic is about building data discovery and classification at scale. Uh, a little bit about us before we get started. So uh, we both are software engineers on the data security team at Airbnb, and we are working on uh, building data privacy and security tools and infrastructures at Airbnb. Uh, so. Uh, does anyone know the game called Where's Waldo? Yeah, I see a couple of hands here. So cool. So basically, in this game, you'll be presented with a comic picture, culture uh, crowded with hundreds of thousands of people, and you're challenged to find a character named Waldo hidden in a crowd. So uh, can you find Waldo here at first glance? No. <laughs> yeah, I know it's hard. So basically, uh, Waldo is here. And so, okay, so let's consider a slightly different scenario in a modern tech company setting when our company grows to uh, serve traffic for millions of users uh, around the world. Uh, we use data, data centers to uh, store petabytes of data, right? And uh, in this scenario, like what if one of our valued a user called Waldo that asks, "Hey, uh, where is my W two? And can you can we quickly find out where his W two is and uh, let him like take action on his data? Or let's say uh, our company uh, uh, faces uh, like uh, some request from a law enforcement agency and he asks uh, us to like find out all the W two data that is stored uh, for our uh, customers and we he asks us to." Uh, uh, find out all the data and try to encrypt all this data. So can we quickly find out this data in all the data stores that could be scattered every every round uh, ev in every um, uh, data store type we have and take actions on them? So basically, as time go by, uh, many of the companies in the world will uh, be asked the same question. So and this is what we are trying to uh, focus on in this topic here. And so. In this presentation, we are going to cover the following topic, uh, which is to how to build a data uh, discovery and classification solution in a company, which can be scalable um, as company grows, and also uh, robust to failures. So for the rest of this presentation, we will first introduce some background of the problem and uh, the problem we are trying to solve here. And then we will present an in-house solution uh, that we came up with at Airbnb. And uh, next, we will analyze some alternatives that uh, already exist in the industry and try to explain why we built our own in-house platform. And finally, we will share some uh, challenges with Matt, uh, Kevin, who have experienced, and also suggestions for uh, those of you who want to build your own in-house solution. So I will pass it to Lizzie to talk about some backgrounds. Yeah, so there are two aspects of why we wanted to build such a data classification solution. One is because of data security. So sometimes sensitive data can leak into unintended data stores. So passwords, API keys, and this can be done via logs, old pieces of code that no one knows is there. And these data stores sometimes don't have the proper access controls because no one really knows that sensitive data is stored there. So this could be an exposed S3 bucket, uh, misconfigured IAM permissions, or it could have sufficient access controls for, for the public, but not sufficient access controls for employees. The second one is for data privacy. So uh, the public is actually becoming more and more concerned over the security, privacy, and lack of control of their data. And regulators have started to standardize data security policies across the globe. Europe came up with GDPR, which was the first major privacy act in 2018. And now more than 80 countries and states have their own data privacy laws, uh, notably CCPA in California uh, that came out in January 1st this year. So with all these laws, what happens if we don't comply? Well, companies can face very strict fines. So for GDPR, a company could face the greater of 20 million euros or 4% of the company's annual revenue. And for CCPA, it could be $7,500 for each violation, each person's violation. So these fines can easily add up and force companies out of business if they're not careful. So. With these laws, users have three main rights, which is access 
so access to all their personal data. Portability, which is similar to access, but it should be in a machine readable format so that they can transmit them to another company. And erasure, which is the right to be forgotten. So erase all their personal data from their company. But what does personal data really mean? Personal data is super broad. These laws keep it super vague. So it could mean a full name, an address, location data, any inference made on the user, no real definition there. And it could add up to more than 100 different data element types. So what data do we have on Waldo? So what could a company store? So we could store his W2, his picture, his a JSON blob with his city state email his IP address, marriage certificate, social security number, credit card number information, and driver's license. And this could be everywhere. So S3 bucket, MySQL database, Hive database. So when Waldo's like, where's my data? I want all my data. How are we supposed to find it? So figuring this out is super hard. Sensitive data can be everywhere. Companies uh, generate ex an enormous amount of data every day, and it's replicated and propagated everywhere. A lot of companies actually ended up complying with these laws manually, so a human would go through every single database table by table to figure out where the sensitive data is, and this really doesn't scale since a human is doing this. It takes so much time. It's so boring. It's continuous. You have to do it every time a new table comes out, and it's hard to keep track of what you've already done. So now Pinyao is going to talk about how we started to solve this at Airbnb to do this automatically. Cool. Um, so addre to address these challenges, we decided that um, we should build a platform instead of uh, running one of scripts uh, for data discovery and classification across all of all of our data stores. Um, so before we actually started building our uh, platform, we thought about the requirements that we need to fulfill. Well, first of all, uh, we want this platform to be able to cat categorize data target into specific data type, data element types, which means that we want to figure out like whether a column contains uh, email address, or phone numbers, or whatever data elements or not. And uh, secondly, uh, to to take follow up actions on these uh, data elements or sensitive data elements of our interest, we also need to po pinpoint where exactly uh, the data is, uh, which means that we want to like have an exact offset in, for example, you know, text corpus or like uh, the offset in a table cell, etc. And since the data stores are growing like every day, we make updates to our production database, and it got replicated to every pla uh, every like um, other um, like uh, store um, um, data at rest uh, data stores. So uh, we want the platform to be able to continuously scan our data, including a various data store types such as Hive, MySQL, S3, etc. And as the data elements have different f uh, formats, we also uh, want to be able to scan these different formats w with different scanning methods. For example, like uh, we might be uh, using regular expression to uh, recognize uh, uh, emails, phone numbers, because they have like certain formats. But for some other uh, data elements like address, uh, they could be have very very different formats for like different countries, different languages. And so uh, we need to we need to have like multiple scanning methods to support all these data elements. And last but not least, last but not least, the whole uh, purpose of uh, data classification is to like take actions on them. So um, in, uh, which means that we want the a platform to support um, triggering various actions, such as like sending emails to the stakeholder or like creating a ticket for someone to solve, etc. So now we will go through some uh, key components for our uh, solution. And at high level, uh, the platform should uh, sample data from our data store, scan the data, and then trigger actions uh, regarding the scanning results. Uh, so the platform works as shown uh, uh, in the following diagram. So uh, there are three uh, processes, um, basically. So first is the pre-scan. The pre-scan process would sample data from our data source, aggregate this data, and prepare scanning tasks to be executed. And after that, the data uh, scan process should scan the data and find out the sensitive uh, data element of our interest. 
and next is the post scan process where it can aggregate the uh, scan results together and trigger actions uh, to either notify the stakeholder or take other actions according, accordingly to protect our sensitive data. So we figured that uh, also uh, UI would be great, would very helpful for viewing the, the, the results and also like initiate the scans. Uh, so basically the three main processes can be mapped into three components uh, uh, when we are uh, building this solution. Uh, the first one is called test creation, which maps to the pre-scan process, which we mentioned earlier. And then the scanning component, which maps to the data scan process. And then finally, the result processing component, which maps to the post-scan process. And next, we will talk about uh, the three main components in more detail. So first, uh, test creation. So when we are handling uh, petabytes of data uh, in our company, we can't really afford uh, scanning all the data we have every day. And we need to have a way to downsize the data that we, ha that we have and specify what we want to scan. So the test creation service would allow us to specify like different data target we want to scan and be able to sample like just a portion of the data, not like scanning the whole data. And so here we allow the user to define jobs that specifies what we, where we want to scan and what we want to scan. And a job would consist of um, a list of data targets with a list of data element uh, what they want to scan uh, uh, against. And uh, a job can be defined by user and can be scheduled at what like one time only, or continuously scanning, or like uh, if we just want to scan on the new data updates, then we can also allow that. Um, also, finally, of course, and we want them to be able to specify the actions that they want to take uh, when the results are found. So you might be wondering, like we we mentioned, this component is called a task creator. Then why do we why do we uh, mention a concept called job? Well, uh, as we might expect, the data target that is um, specified across different jobs might overlap because different people may, they might want to create uh, the same um, a job that can uh, scan on the same target. So for example, multiple jobs, they want to scan the same target. And in this case, we want to aggregate the work that scans the same target a data target together, so we can save some computational resources. So this 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 is why we uh, want to do this what we call task aggreg uh, aggregation. Um, so uh, in a task in a task we uh, define we define a unit of work that aggregate the scanning job to run and. Uh, in each of the tasks, we ensure that uh, each data target can be uh, will be only scanned uh, will be scanned only once during scanning. Uh, let's let's say uh, let's take a look at an example here. So basically, this example shows uh, two jobs are created, and uh, in the in, uh, to the right to the left, you can see that uh, there are two jobs, and uh, each job is created to scan two data stores, uh, two data targets. Uh, job one schedules to scan first name and last name on uh, the users table and also the listings table on MySQL database. Also, job two uh, is scheduled to scan email and phone number on um, uh, MySQL database or the user users table database, and also an S3 bucket. And so, in, in this case, when we do a uh, task aggregation, we will aggregate um, for each task. We will uh, scan only one data target, but aggregate all those data elements of interest together into the same task. So in this way, we can avoid like uh, spending uh, computational resources on uh, the same data target again and again. And now I will pass back to Lizzie to talk about the next component, which is scanning. So uh, once the tasks are created, they're actually put up onto a message queue. So our scanning service basically listens to that message queue, takes a task from the message queue, and then that message contains what data target we want to scan, what data elements we want to scan it with. And so it does that, then it generates the matching results. So how do we detect these data elements? We have to support various scanning algorithms because different data elements require different ways of finding them. So for example, we allow regular expression, which is good when the data element follows a very specific format. So emails, phone numbers, 
that can easily be detected using regexes. We also allow try-based substring matching. So basically, if you have a data set in your data store that contains, for example, first names, you can store this all in a try. And if you want to see whether any of those first names are in a text as a substring, this is great for that. And Bloom filter is also good when you have a definitive data set because you can store it all and it's pretty memory efficient, but you can't detect substrings. You can only match with the exact string. So if I want to see if my first name is the exact string that I'm passing it with, then it's good for that. But it can also cause false positives. We also allow ML models, which are good for complex data elements that have different formats. So addresses, for example, are different in every country. That's a good way, to, that's a good reason to use machine learning. Also, if sometimes different data elements have, the same, have a common format, but that format is shared across different elements. So for example, if I'm searching for a birth date, how do I know if it's actually a birth date or if it's just a random created at date? So sometimes it's good to look at the metadata to see like the column name, does it contain the word birth, things like that. So we support methods to run regexes on the metadata. And also, sometimes none of these methods can work, so we have to hard code a scanning method in our code because we want to use a library that does this already. So we also support ad hoc methods by hard coding them into our system. So if a data element can be detected using the method specified previously, we put, we can configure, we, ha, we use JSON to configure these scanning methods together. So when we want to, since we want it with the currency privacy, with the current privacy laws, we need to detect more than 100 different data element types. So as more privacy laws come in, we need to constantly be adding new data elements. And so using JSON allows us to quickly iterate. We also need to quickly update these scanning methods since Let's say we write a regex, it causes a lot of false positives. We want to quickly change the regex to make it more accurate. So JSON allows us to do that as well. And the fact that we do this in an online configuration without, uh, and it's not written in our code, that means we don't have to redeploy the entire system and wait 20 minutes for this code to be deployed onto our system. Finally, uh, JSON allows us to easily understand these detection mechanisms. So if someone has, wants to know how we're detecting first names, they can just look at this JSON file and kind of get it. So this is an example of how we detect employer identification number. So here we define a first method uh, that checks for the following regex in the content of the data. So EINs follow a very specific format, so two digits, a dash, then seven more digits. So we check to see if that content matches that regex. Then we saw that the, con that, that the regex caused some false positives because some random string actually matched with that as well. So we also check to see whether the words EIN and tax are in the content before or after that regex. Finally, we also look at the metadata, so we check to see if EIN and tax are present in the metadata, such as the column name, object name. And then we can put it all together using this evaluation expression. So we want to check for the regex in the content and the keywords in the metadata, or we want to check for the content for the regex and the keyword. So now, just a deep dive on why we decided to do machine learning. So some data elements are pretty hard to classify, such as address, first name, and last name. Since there's so many different formats, it's probably impossible to get a list of all the valid addresses in the world, or first names and last names especially. And they could all be in different languages. So writing a regex for every single one can take a long time. So an ML model is a natural fit for us to handle such complicated data elements. Since we do store also a large amount of this data at Airbnb, we have people's addresses, we have people's first and last names. So we can train an ML model with this data as a positive sample. And then we combine ML with other methods to reduce false positive rates. So here is just an example of how we're using ML to detect address. So we have a production table that we know for a fact has a column that contains addresses. So we extract a sample of that table and train our ML model with that as a positive sample. Then 
we look at some offline data stores, check to see for tables that don't contain addresses. So we know it's a false positive. Uh, it's a true negative, sorry. Then we can train the model as, with that as a negative sample. And then we can quickly deploy this model to an online scoring service. So depending on how your company does it, we could just deploy the model to, to another service. And from our platform, we can just query that service to see whether our text is actually an address or not using the model we created. Uh, then, as you can see, we get the results from the online scoring service and combine it with like a regex and try to see if it's actually an address. And that's how we would classify addresses. So it's important when we built our service to make it easily extendable to new data stores. Since we have maybe so many different data stores at Airbnb, we use MySQL, Hive, DynamoDB, S3, Redis. So uh, we need to quickly uh, be able to scan these data stores. So instead of re-implementing the logic for scanning for every single data store, we just implement the logic to connect and fetch data from that data store and the scanning logic remains the same. We also built the system to easily extend to different accounts. So in AWS, there's the concept of accounts and companies usually have different accounts for either different environments. So staging account, production account, dev account, and also M&A account. So every time we do a new acquisition, that acquisition probably has its own account and is not gonna migrate all their data to our own account. So we wanna scan that as well. So the way we would do this is in AWS, you could create an IAM role in that new account with the proper permissions to fetch and get that data. And then we can grant our services IAM role permission to assume that role in the different account. And so when a user creates a job, we could just specify the account number and the IAM role and our, our scanning service knows that it needs to assume this role every time it's scanning that specific account. Also, we can scale easily horizontally because we built the system using Kubernetes. It's fully distributed. All the nodes are stateless, can pick up any job from the message queue. We can just increase scanning throughput by increasing the number of pods that we have. And that allows us to scan petabytes of data per day. And the fact that we have different components for different uh, for the different aspects of this platform, so we have the task creator, then we have the scanning, allows us to scale scanning separately since it represents the bulk of our computation, and uh, since we're scanning billions of S3 objects and hundreds of thousands of data warehouse tables with billions of rows. And uh, yeah, so also we're able to scale instantly and automatically by spinning up and down pods based on CPU utilization. So we don't have to manually scale up or down. It's done automatically, and it also helps us reduce costs since if the CPU isn't being used for some reason, then it would just scale down. Finally, message queues actually allow us to be more robust since we can automatically retry. Uh, in message queues, if a worker doesn't specifically delete a message, then it will reappear n number of times for someone else to try. So if a worker dies, a dependency is down, or if they can't delete that message for some reason from the queue, it'll reappear for someone else to take. So now I'm gonna pass it on to Pinyao, who's gonna talk about the result processing component of our service. Okay, um, so the result processing is the third component of our platform. So as we mentioned previously, uh, the jobs are aggregated together uh, by uh, data targets. Uh, to reduce competi uh, repetitive computation. And when tasks, they are finished, uh, we need to de-aggregate them back and map the result back to the jobs to you know, aggregate the result and to take the action. So when the task completes, we will uh, update the map, the status map of each job re uh, associated with the task and then um, append the related task result to each job and determine when, when a job is completed or not. And if a job is completed, completed then we will trig that, trigger the action which is related to the job. So for instance, uh, in this case, uh, when uh, e each of these three tasks finishes, then uh, it will update, update the status of the two, two jobs. And when each job uh, figures like uh, all, the, all the work that is required is done, then it will mark as finish it, finish it and then um, trigger the action either, which is either an email 
uh, sent to some stakeholder or uh, creating a Jira ticket for to ask someone to mitigate the problem. <coughs> So even if we can define uh, some of the actions like we uh, saw earlier, the email or sending, sending email or like creating Jira tickets, um, but sometimes we know that cus uh, customers may want to like want customized actions to uh, to fit their needs. So we understand we cannot like implement implement every action that we allow people to take uh, from our platform. So in that case, we. Uh, Created a common result queue where uh, people can, uh, well, our um, scanning service can uh, post messages to the queue with metadata about the results, which includes the data target that is matched with uh, the data element specified and also the offset of the ma match, so that downstream services can subscribe to this queue and uh, to take actions uh, when they receive a message. And uh, this would allow other teams to. Um, take customized action based on their needs and also allowing them to own their own uh, action taking pipeline. So uh, take our GDPR services, for example. Um, uh, for example, like in encryption service and deletion service. Uh, well, um, each, each of these services can subscribe to uh, different data elements of their interest. So for, for, for instance, in encryption service can subscribe to uh, um, a data element which is address and when it receives a message uh, that says hey um, a nest rib object uh, contains address data then the encryption service can um, trigger an action to uh, encrypt this uh, object so that anyone who does not have permission would not be able to uh, read the action, uh, address data from this uh, S3 object. Uh, similarly for deletion service they can like uh, subscribe to uh, like phone number data element. So whenever there is a message that contains a uh, scanning result which uh, reflects a, a detection of phone numbers in, for example, a Hive table, then it can trigger action to like uh, keep it a record. And so in future, mm -hmm. when someone wants to delete their phone numbers from our data stores, then we can like delete them accordingly. Next is uh, about the UI. So uh, as a data discovery and classification service, so uh, there should be several stakeholders that might be interested in this tool in a company. Uh, for example, like a legal team. Well, uh, they, they pretty much want a, like a high level summary of what data, data element exists uh, in our data stores and how much percent of the data stores we have scanned. And uh, also we might have a data privacy and compliance team, which Basically, are the enforcer of this uh, these laws, uh, and they might want to keep track of the overall mitigation process when we detect something. And also, we, ha we could have data owners. Well, uh, they could be engineers or data scientists. They want to kick off some new jobs to uh, to scan uh, some newly created table that they uh, uh, they just created and to view the result of a specific data target. So uh, UI would be significant to reduce uh, the amount of work uh, we can s satisfy these people uh, to uh, mm, uh, you know, conduct their daily job. And uh, we can also enforce some uh, role-based permission control with the UI to easily allow them to you know, uh, access different things uh, that they are allowed to. So here uh, we present uh, some example pages we think the UI would look like, and just to give an impression impression about the UI. So this page is a, a job creation page, where user can use it to launch jobs to scan their own data. Um, as you can see on this page, the uh, user can uh, specify different aspects of a data target that they want to scan. For example, like a, a AWS account or a S3 uh, path. Um, and they can also specify the data element they want to scan and how do we want to take action on, uh, on them, whether we want to email someone or like create Jira tickets or do some encryption uh, actions on them, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this is a search result page. Uh, well, we can show the search result records per user search criteria. And it can show uh, rows of matched data content, and the data is data element is matched with, and possibly some actions and mitigation that they can take on each each of these scanned result. 
So basically, the UI would give, will give us a nice interface for users to interact with the scanning result that we pr produced from the platform and also uh, kick off jobs easily. And next, I will pass it back to Lizzie to talk about some alternatives. So before building our tool, we actually thought that maybe we could use a third party tool that already exists instead of building it in-house. But we, after studying, um, we decided that we, sh we should build in-house just because of some factors that I'm going to talk about now. So we mainly considered two solutions, AWS Basie and Netscope. Uh, but yeah, we decided to build our own tool because the main reason was the data store coverage. Uh, the main requirement of this tool was that we wanted to scan a all data stores that Airbnb actually uses. And when we looked at Macy and Netscope, they actually, out of all the data stores we use in the cloud, they only scan S3, so none of them actually scan MySQL or even Hive or DynamoDB or any other uh, data store. And then we considered the pricing factor. So obviously in-house, it's the cost of engineers that work on it, but it's also the cost of running the service and the API request cost to get the data from these data stores. But with Macy, it costs $5 per gig for every gig you scan, plus the API request. So that could quickly add up. And with Netscope, it's also based on the amount of customer support you need, so it's pretty complicated to calculate how much exactly it would have cost us. Um, the other main reason why we decided to build in-house is that because we wanted to find all the personal data elements that Airbnb has. So since the term is so broad, every company has to detect different data elements. For example, at Airbnb, we have this concept of a listing. So when you list your room or house on Airbnb for someone to book, it comes with a listing ID, and that is considered personal data, and we have to delete it if a user requests to delete that data. So we needed to be able to find things like this. So in Macy, we're not able to customize an, any data element we want to find for. They just come with a predefined list. And with Netscope, we could give a custom regex, but can't use machine learning or anything else. Finally, with sampling, we have billions of rows in MySQL. We have billions of objects in S3. We don't want to scan them all. We want to scan. Uh, we want to do more of a breadth first search versus a depth first search because, for example, if you find that a MySQL column contains addresses, you don't need to really scan the rest to figure out that all the other columns also contain, all the other rows also contain addresses. So for S3, because it's the only one that's ex applicable between the three, we wanted to customize the amount of objects we scan. And with Macy and Netscope, we could either choose to scan all the backfill or only the updates, and we couldn't just scan a sample of the objects that already exist. Finally, we also looked at the amounts of bytes scanned per object, and with Macy and Netscope, we could only scan the first X bytes and not scan the rest. So we also wanted to be able to customize this and scan whichever bytes we wanted of a file. So for these reasons, we actually decided to build our in-house tool. So now I'm going to pass it back to Pinyao so that he can talk about the challenges we faced by building this. All right. Um, so we I have some. Uh, we want to share some challenges we've met during building this solution, and also uh, some caveats we experienced and some suggestions if you want to build your own tool in your company. And the first thing we consider is uh, the accuracy. So since accuracy is uh, crucial for a classification tool, because this is the only way to make it make your downstream services to be able to functional. And uh, when we are building uh, the scanning method for different uh, uh, data elements, we had several iter iterations on each. So uh, for example, like uh, when we're like scanning emails. We build it with regexes, but we occasionally still see some false, false, false positives in the couple of in the first couple of iterations. So we continuously monitor them and then uh, try to reduce uh, the false positive by you know um, adding different you know changes to um, the regex that we built for emails. So in that sense, uh, false positives need to be consistently monitored and take uh, iterations to improve the result. And to achieve this, uh, it, it, it would be better if we have a, 
uh, more uh, comprehensive uh, for, um, testing environment to experiment uh, uh, with customized, customizable test data. Um, whenever we want to like create a new uh, scanning method for our new data element, or we want to make some modifications to the existing data element, uh, we want we probably need to like run the tests on this uh, new uh, this updated. Uh, scanning method before we actually deploy that to uh, production uh, to avoid you know uh, affecting our downstream services um, also um, it might be a good idea to have some kind of uh, feedback system from our downstream services uh, so that uh, whenever uh, the downstream services like find out a false positive uh, and you think uh, the the platform thinks that's an address, but actually it's not an address. Then the uh, downstream services should have a good way to report it back and uh, incorporate it into the platform. Uh, for example, you can put it that put that into a deny list. So next time when you see this, you would not report it as an address. Or um, uh, in some cases, for example, if you are using like machine learning models, uh, the feedback can be helpful to help you build the uh, negative sample. So you can y use this. Um, um, false positive samples and feed them back to your training process uh, to make your ML model more robust. And uh, the next one is uh, privacy and security. So uh, even as a privacy and security tool itself, it also has uh, privacy and security concerns, of course. And for instance, when we are talking about the UI, um, we mentioned there are like a couple of uh, stakeholders which are relevant to this platform and would like to use our platform. So uh, since they have different roles and requirements, so they, they should probably like have uh, different permissions to view the results, to perform actions, to have access uh, to have like have access to a different uh, part of the resource, etc. And other than that, uh, as we might expect, this tool should be uh, should have a lot of uh, access uh, to our data stores. Like they should be uh, ideally, they should have read access to all of our data stores where we want to scan, which is kind of dangerous. So we kind of want to protect and limit the access to uh, this service role itself. And next one is production impact. So. Uh, as we mentioned, the tool we're building is uh, going to have access to majority of our data stores, which includes the production data stores. And we should need to be extremely careful uh, for that, because otherwise it could, would cause ca catastrophic consequences. Um, so we want to minimize the production impact. Uh, and one thing to do that is to uh, scan, restore, or non-production instances, or replicas of these production data stores. Uh, also, um, rate limiting might be a good idea uh, for the API cost to production data source. And also, more importantly, uh, before we actually implement a scanning, we should have a constant communication with uh, uh, the storage team um, to like uh, have expectation on what kind of uh, travel uh, traffic uh, it will cause and whether this will take down um, their storage system. And finally, uh, uh, regarding the operational work, uh, um, so basically we should keep in mind that uh, we want to automate uh, as much as possible, uh, such as uh, calculating false positives or reducing false positive rate. And um, otherwise, it, you will find yourself swamped in operational works, uh, such as like responding to other teams to, um, uh, to their scanning requests or deliver um, some scanning results manually, etc. Also, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, enabling uh, teams to own their own pipeline would be a good idea so that um, you, you can somehow create a, a common uh, result queue for them to subscribe. And if they want to do some customized actions on them, they can own their own pipeline and so that they don't need to bother you. <coughs> also, um, uh, we found that we found that uh, online configuration instead of uh, uh, like code deployment would uh, make our our lives easier because um, we uh, we we started as like doing code deployment uh, whenever we add a new data element or make some changes to the data data element scanning methods and we found it very cumbersome uh, later because like code development uh, code um, develop, uh, deployment would cost a lot of time as you might have you know a lot of uh, code testing, you know, uh, code coverage, 
uh, test coverage, testing, et cetera. So um, having a, like an online configuration system where you can like uh, modify the JSON blobs online and make them push that to production fairly quickly, uh, you know, separate from the code deployment would be a very good idea. And regarding the future work, um, one thing that we might think uh, is to build some kind of data association um, or uh, data flow association across different uh, data stores, such as uh, like uh, we can monitor the DB export uh, in our data store when like uh, to build some kind of association between different data. So that uh, whenever we detect something in one data store, then based on this association, we can come up with some heuristics to uh, scan uh, some other data stores uh, instead of like you know randomly um, scanning other uh, data stores, so this could uh, make it more efficient. And the second one is that when we are uh, trying to uh, take actions, we found that there are a lot of uh, uh, ownership problems. So um, and many data targets they don't have uh, real ownership. Uh, so uh, in that case, uh, when we want to take some automated actions. It is gonna be very hard. So uh, we also want to think about like enforcing uh, ownerships for data stores. And uh, we want to give some thanks to our uh, team members. Uh, they helped us a lot on the design of the platform. And with that, uh, uh, concludes our talk, and we will take questions. A couple of questions. Thank you. Uh, a great talk. So first question is, does your tool scan encrypted data or only plain text data? Only plain text. Okay. We don't decrypt anything. Yeah. All right. And second question is, I, I've heard the word petabytes a few times during the talk. And the question is, what kind of data does Airbnb own that, that's petabytes of data? I understand like images and videos, uh, maybe, but we just that's, that's a lot. <laughs> to be honest, I'm not, I'm not, yeah. I'm not really sure what type of data, but it's mainly because of S3. We have billions of objects. No one really knows what's inside of them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think as company grows, like uh, the data, like uh, figuring out like where we store the data and what we store in the data store is a very hard problem. Like uh, you might think we don't store many of our user data, but actually we. Uh, uh, as the company grows bigger, like there are tons of data like during you know uh, each phase of the engineering work or like business operation or you know uh, all these different units of our work would like generate tons of data yeah. How many man hours did it take to build the tool or and what technology? Uh, we're constantly building, yeah. but it basically takes like we've been working on this for two years and um, two people mm -hmm. only. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We have a, we have some people to help us build the JSON and the regex for the regexes and stuff. But the main platform is just two engineers, and we use Java. Yeah. As a technology. Yeah. yeah. So the project first started like when we have to comply with the uh, GDPR uh, regulation. So uh, after that, we have, we've been com um, doing several iterations to improve this platform. And uh, starting from uh, last year, we uh, like kind of like um, make this platform running, and then uh, uh, that can allow you know contractors to work on the uh, implementing the scanning methods, scanning methods for new da data elements. So that frees us from you know uh, you know working on you know detailed. Retroaxes or some other tries to you know so that we can focus on more on like building features for this platform. Thank you. Uh, was this like a one-off thing, or are you guys like continuously continuously scanning like your data sources for any changes in the future? Still continuously scanning, yeah, because people keep adding new rows, new objects. Still scanning. Okay, so after scanning, do you like label them for like your future, uh, like any kind of like processes that you want to do? Oh, like yeah, we do label what we found, and then we can take action on that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, got it. Have you considered OCR for 
any reasons other than just, I mean, you look at plain text, but what about forms that have been scanned or anything like that? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, basically, we uh, at LNB, we, we have a lot of like images, like, and some of the requirements for GDPR uh, ask us to like detect, you know, um, whether there is a user uh, showing up on an Im image or things like that, or whether there are like uh, emails or text that it, that is, you know, uh, putting on um, an image. So uh, right now we are like working on. Um, uh, um, uh, incorporating some uh, like OCR tools into our platform, where we can like uh, uh, scan uh, those images and see whether there is any like tags or users. Basically, we're like trying to expand our scanning methods, like other than you know uh, just focusing on detecting uh, on texts, but also expand to you know images or like voices uh, or uh, videos uh, if it's as required. Cool. And follow up on that. So, are there any plans to open source parts of this or all of it? We want to. It's just um, we're understaffed. We're understaffed, <laughs> and it's way easier to just build on the existing infrastructure that Airbnb already has for deployment for everything else. So maybe, yeah. hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I have one question. Um, how do you, I think you mentioned that, you know, like figuring out what data you have in the stores that you know you have is a big problem. How do you manage onboarding and manage the stores that you don't know you have? <laughs> because we have data stores that I don't know I have, right? So how so, do I find them? So we scan, like, for example, we scan all the databases in production accounts. So in AWS, we know, like, we can scan all these databases in the production account. But if for some reason there's an account that we don't know about, then yeah, we don't scan that account. So, so Lydia, like if a, if a developer is bringing out a date, like do you have so? How do you onboard them? Basically, they should they just should know that you're there. And usually, they would create a database in one of the accounts that we already have. So we list like we call a list API to list all the databases that are there, and then do that that way. But yeah, if someone just creates a random AWS account for himself, we probably wouldn't catch that unless they told us. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, just to follow up on that, I think we also had a same uh, similar problem. Uh, we used uh, infrastructure as a management tool like Terraform to identify data sources, and then we went and uh, scanned like individual data sources rather than reaching out to a product teams, which would definitely not scale. So yeah, just to follow up on that. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you very much. Hey.